those of you who'd like to write might best learn to write by working for the Daily Cougar because you write quickly, you write accurately, and you write to an audience. This is what J.B. Harrison says in The Profession of English. He says the best American writers have first been journalists because they learn these three distinctive qualities. And the opportunity to work with a newspaper on this campus that produces as many as a 16 to 24 pages daily with all the input of people, editors, reporters, proofreaders, typographers, gives you an incredible experience in the publishing world. You're a long way from the Tatler, which was published as a broadside, printed on one sheet of paper. The Tatler was printed on two sides, and it was distributed some 3,000 copies, because that's all you could run off in a 12-hour day. Today, you can run off 100,000 copies in an hour on printing presses. But the importance of the printing press can't be de-emphasized because without the printing press, you could not have democracy. Democracy is the spread of ideas. This is the only paper, the only opportunity you have on this campus to express your views and to discover what's happening. In the 18th century, this became one of the devices by which people could read. Of course, it wasn't in the plastic case. And we're going to talk about these... Uh, the Tatler and the Spectator and journalism today. I'll pass this about so you can hold on to it. Let's first of all talk about the art of printing because the art of printing is a little bit different than the art of publishing. The art of printing allows you to disseminate material but pu publishing is a means of restricting or identifying the quality of the material. What I have here is from an internet site. It's uh, APM Brooks, B R O O K E S dot A C dot United Kingdom, that's England. Publishing, context, impact, chronol, meaning chronology, C H R O N O L dot H T M. In 1611, we know the king's printer, Christopher Barker, printed the authorized version uh, of the Bible. But one of the concerns was who was going to publish other material in this period. And consequently, during this period, most of the printing offices in London were under the control of the Stationers' Company. The Stationers' Company was essentially the censorship uh, agency for the government. And everything had to be submitted to the stationer's company uh, at first, before it could be published. <clears throat> Notice in 1642, Parliament tried to reinforce the licensing system. It banned unlicensed news. And in fact, there are only about 39 printing presses in all of England, publishing at the time, they could all be identified. But the key is this, that in 1693, Parliament rejected the renewal of the Printing Act, and it represented the end of pre-publication censorship. In other words, you didn't have to submit something to a printer anymore, you could print something, and if the, government want, wanted, if the government wanted to go after you, they could do that. But it would be after the fact. Uh, the newspaper of this university, according to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, is owned by the citizens of Texas. If you appoint an editor, if the university appoints an editor, that editor is now governed by the laws of Texas, which, which means he cannot be removed by the officers of this university or by the trustees uh, because they don't like what he has printed. This is uncensored newspaper and I think they're rather proud of it. And being able to write for an uncensored newspaper 
I think is, for, is, is very, very important. And knowing that the citizens of Texas want you to read this newspaper, want you to write in it, and want you to help publish it is relatively significant. But in England, the effect was that if you no longer had to register a printing press, then anyone could publish. And in fact, the consequences of the removal of the Printing Act was the distribution and the purchase of printing, plants, printing presses all over England so that you had a ready supply for people who wanted to write. Now when you have a ready supply for people who want to write, the void has to be filled. And the void was filled by periodical journalism. This is the rise of the magazine, which would come out two to three times weekly, and then it quickly moved into a six-day magazine when we get to the spectator, and journalism became a very, very important uh, uh, development in this period. Of course, in America, 1737, uh, Peter Zenger was put on trial by the British for, <coughs> for sedition because he had published information the British didn't want. <coughs> They couldn't find a jury to convict them. And after 1737, there's total freedom of the press in uh, America. Uh, you can be sued for slander, you can be sued by libel, but you cannot be sued for presenting uh, your ideas and your thoughts. In England, very recently, the stationer's, a, a company was fi the stationer's authority was finally... Uh, uh, omitted or uh, fell into disuse and no longer do you have censorship in England. Now, what does that mean? Let's look at some of the productions that happened at this period. All right. In 1681 to 1687, Sir Roger Lestrange published The Observator, probably one of the first newspapers, actual newspapers in uh, English life. The Athenian Gazette from 1690 to 97 became an important publication in the 18th century. The London Spy by Ned Ward, published from 1698 to 1700, a man by the name of Fritz Wilhelm Neumann at Frankfurt University is the expert in the world in the publications of Ned Ward's The London Spy. These all can be found on microfilm and you can read them. But the work we're going to look at is The Tatler. The Tatler is a major publication. It began April 12, 1709, and ran through January 2, 1711. It comprised 271 issues, and the main author was Sir Richard Steele. His name is not on the screen. S-T-E-E-L-E, -E -E, Sir Richard Steele. Sir Richard Steele was a playwright. He was an essayist. He later became manager of the Drury Lane Theatre. He was a member of Parliament until Defoe clandestinely accused, found that he had bought votes and he was banished from Parliament. But Steele was a major drive between uh, for, for the development of the Tatler. He was assisted with Joseph Addison who was the secretary to the Lord Lieutenant of the Realm. Addison was probably the finest classical scholar in England. And they had assistance from Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift, who later wrote Gulliver's Travels. Now, how did they produce this newspaper? First of all, it was <coughs> a penny per piece. First, it was the first four numbers were given free and then it cost you a penny a piece. For the last week I've been, 
finding on my lawn in the mornings the Wall Street Journal. They're giving me free copies of the Wall Street Journal in the hope that I'll eventually subscribe to it. They haven't changed their, their technique, uh, and it's no different from what Addison and Steele did when they started the Tatler. The magazine is published in a folio half sheet, and what that essentially means is that you would have the front and back printed on one side. Yeah, you would set the front and the back on one uh, uh, stand of type, and you would print it on this side. Then you would print it on the opposite side as well, so that the first page and the last page, the first page and the second page were opposite each other. Then you would slice the pages down the middle, and you would have two copies of the Tatler for each sheet of paper. That's what the way it was printed, folio half sheet. It was published Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Why? Because you had a set type on Wednesdays, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. It's that simple. It's an amazing thing. You go into the Cougar office today around a, you know, 1 o'clock. People start bringing in their articles. People get new assignments. By 4 o'clock, the articles are written. By 5 o'clock, they're being set in type. The, the computer type is being transferred to uh, images. The images are then being put on film. The film is being developed so it can be transferred to a printing plant on campus. And by 2 or 3 in the morning, you have uh, tens of thousands of newspapers published. But they didn't do that in the 18th century. You had to set type from hand, and then you had to put it into chases, and then you had to print each sheet, each sheet individually, and then you had to distribute them. What do they say is the purpose of the Tatler? The general purpose of the paper is to expose the false arts of life, to pull off the disguises of cunning, vanity, and affectation, and to recommend a general simplicity in our dress, our discourse, and our behavior. Now, these articles in the Tatler and Spectator are written in what we call the middle style. They're not written in the high style of Lily's Euphues. They're not written in the low style of a novel or the common style of a novel. There's a certain elegance, but it's not uh, beyond the reach of the normal reader. Incidentally, there were 3,000 copies of this paper published daily. It's estimated that at least 12 people would read the paper in coffee houses and other places. So you have a readership of about, of about 36,000. That's equated to about the numbers of people who would read um, the Saturday Review or Atlantic Monthly in our population. So we're always talking, we're always talking about a rather limited audience when we're trying to describe the readers of this period. Now, the journalists have ways of doing things. You know that every Wednesday a certain columnist is going to show up in the Cougar. Every Monday a different columnist. They set things up. Well, when Addison and Steele began to write these essays, they claimed that anything that was to have come, and this would be the alleged source of this information, Anything that would come from White's Chocolate House near St. James's Palace would deal with gallantry, pleasure, and entertainment. Anything that would come from Will's Coffee House, which was where poets met, would be a place for Dryden, uh, would be a place for poetry, for the discussion of poetry. Will's Coffee House is a meeting place for poets Dryden, Wycherley, Congreve, Addison, and his coterie, and others would be meeting at this place. And if you picked up something that said Will's Coffee House, you knew you were dealing with poetry. Button's Coffee House would be the successor to Will's. The Grecian Coffee House is near the Inns of Court, that is, near the... Uh, uh, the courts and the lawyers' offices. Anything that came from St. James's coffee house near the palace would give us foreign and domestic news. 
Of the 271 issues, Richard Steele wrote 188, Addison wrote 42, and 36 others were involved. Now, they also came up with a nice, interesting technique, a technique of identifying various people in society who would be figures and characters of various of these articles that appeared in the magazine. Number 63 is Ned Softly. Ned Softly imposes himself upon the editor, wants the editor to read his poetry, and is very naive as a poet. You have a political, you have Tom Folio, who laughs at people who show off their education, at pedantry, at false learning. There are some rather interesting essays here. There's the adventures of a shilling. A shilling is an English coin. And we'll look in a few moments at the article in the Tatler that gives us the adventures of a shilling. The alleged editor of the Tatler is a Sir Andrew Bickerstaff. His name appears on the title head. And uh, whenever you see Sir Bickerstaff talking or describing events, he is talking about uh, contemporary family and events he himself is particularly associated with. Some articles deal with the relation of parents to children. Items, articles number 235 and 263. Steele describes the death, of his, his, uh, the death of his father at 181. One interesting essay is hoop skirts. A woman is approached by Mr. Bickerstaff, why she wears such large hoop skirts. A hoop skirt is a very large dress that uh, reaches out from the waist. It has about seven slips underneath it to give it breadth and to give it distance. But it's somewhat cumbersome. So Mr. Tatler, her Bickerstaff asked her why she wears such a hoop skirt. And then invites her into his house, and he takes the hoop skirt and lifts it up to the ceiling of his living room, living room where it looks almost as large as the cupola of St. Paul's Cathedral. Now, the cupola of St. Paul's Cathedral you've perhaps never seen, but if you look at the dome of the Texas State Capitol, which imitates St. Paul's Cathedral, you get some idea how large this hoop skirt may have seemed. She goes on to say that she once was very thin, <coughs> and she never wore hoop skirts. But when she walked down the street, the other ladies would laugh at her because she didn't wear hoop skirts. So she decided then to wear hoop skirts. But styles change. And there is a tendency of people then to divest themselves of hoop skirts. Now, this has earned the ire of various manufacturers in England. For example, the cloth manufacturers. If you reduce hoop skirts and you don't have baggy Levi's, then you're going to need less material. And so their profits will go down. So they object to the abolition of hoop skirts. The rope makers, whose rope is used to stiffen, to, to a, uh, hold these skirts together and to give them a certain fiber content, a certain weight, and a certain binding characteristic, they would find themselves with lowered profits. And finally, the whalebone manufacturers. You get whalebone which stiffens these skirts and allows them to spread out. They would lose. And so the essay is not really about hoop skirts, but it's about the mercantilism of, shop, uh, uh, of costuming, the mercantilism of dress, the business of uh, finding ways to build your trade, to replenish to your trade and to allow your trade to flourish. And when you find essays like this, you realize that Addison and Steele are not only talking about politics, not only talking about foreign affairs, they're talking about just the basic instincts and human emotions of human beings. All right, let's look at some of the topics 
than you find in the tattler. The tattler is published three days a week. Number 21 is, uh, number one introduces the various characters whom I've mentioned. Number 21 gives you news from coffee houses. Number 25 deals with the act of dueling. Steele was involved in a duel and injured one of his friends. During his lifetime, dueling was banished in England. And he wrote a play called The Lying Lover, in which a man engages in a duel with his best friend, both of them living a dissolute life. And he stabs his friend, and his friend is about to die. And he reforms. This is the beginning of what we call sentimental drama in 18th century. But it was a very lively play. And the man who was involved in the duel repents, regrets his actions, and is willing to see the end of dueling. Steele himself, as I say, was involved in such a duel. Now what I'd like to do is briefly look at one of the essays that appeared in the Tatler called The Splendid Shilling and show you what essentially happens in this uh, essay. Number 249 deals with a shilling. The shilling was born in Peru. Why was it born in Peru, do you suppose, uh, Miss Chamber, Mr. Chambers? Press, press your button there so we can hear what you're saying. The increase in uh, trade from the colonies. Um, I believe the shilling was, was silver. Right. And Peru was a large <coughs> silver colony. Right. The, the mines and the Latin America was giving England gold and silver. And this coin is brought to England as an ingot by Sir Francis Drake, one of the early privateers. It was minted then with Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth on one side and the country's arms on the other. So essentially this essay on the splendid shilling in the Tatler is a history of England during these times, told by virtue of a coin's passage. The coin traveled throughout continents for the first five years. Why? Because Elizabeth was trading with other countries. It fell in the hands of a miser with 500 others and therefore fell into disuse for a period of time. Then apparently the miser exchanged it at an apothecary's for a pint of sack. He was thirsty for liquor and the coin went to pay for his habit. The coin then transfers from an apothecary to an herb woman, from an herb woman to a butcher, from a butcher to a brewer, from a brewer's wife to a nonconformist preacher. Now that may sound fairly innocent, but one wonders why this, is, these, this coin is traveling from the brewer's wife to the preacher. Of course, it could go into the charity plate. Next, it was shut up in a superstitious woman's purse. She just didn't feel that this coin was one she wanted to spend. But then it was exchanged for 48 farthings. Someone wanted to make a profit by dividing the coin into its parts and by investing smaller amounts. And consequently, we are familiar with uh, trade and uh, the use of coins. The shilling was employed in the civil wars in raising soldiers against the king. Now, is this looked upon as a favorable deed it performed or an act of aggression? Well, it depends on your point of view. But when uh, Steele writes that it was employed against the king, of course, he's a royalist, he's a Tory. Uh, he's unhappy that money is being used to foster military power, to foster might, to look for allies 
course, we did do this today. And the warlords in Afghanistan get large sums of money to keep peace in the area and to cooperate with the uh, uh, Pashtun government. We're doing it as a United States government, uh, using money to win over troops. And that's always been part of warfare. It's then urged by a, used by a sergeant to persuade country fellows to support parliament. So it's used as a bribe. If you're voting and you get yourself $5 or you get yourself a shilling, you're going to vote for the candidate who gives you the money or the candidate who gives you a good steak dinner or the candidate who pays your child's tuition for school for one month. Then it is sacrificed by an officer to a milkmaid. In other words, the milkmaid has given the officer her affections and he has paid her for them. It's thrown under a wall by a disinherited youth, a young man who didn't find, who found that he received less than he had hoped for, is disgusted and just throws the coin away because it's too little for him to, to appreciate. It lies undiscovered from 1649 till 1659 during the time of Cromwell's usurpation. Now we understand. If Cromwell usurped the throne, then the author of this article is anti-Cromwell, pro-Anglican, pro-government, as we had suspected. It is found by a cavalier at the Restoration. These are the uh, people of... Charles's court. These are the Englishmen, the uh, courtiers who sustained and supported Charles's court. It's paid for. It pays for a meal at a cook's shop. And now the coin is getting relatively old. It is aged. It's regarded as a metal rather than a coin. Probably coin collectors are keeping it, hoping to make money just by the sale. Finally, it's obtained by a gambler and then mutilated by an artist who cut off my titles, clipped my brims, retrenched my shape, rubbed me to my inmost ring, spoiled and pillaged me. Whether the artist was uh, possibly ar the artist was using some of the gold, melting it, using it as gilding for something he was creating. Uh, but then it became time to turn in the coin. The coin was turned into the government and it was punched in the belly. What happened? You take a center punch, you punch a hole through it so no one can use it, and then you throw it into the fire to re-coin. The coin is then, he emerges from this fire, is recast, recoined. Uh, and emerges with a greater lust, a greater luster, and a greater beauty. And now he has on himself the face of King William. It's the first example, I believe, of a sex change in literature, other than some of the classical works that you find. So this transvestite coin goes from Elizabeth to William and uh, now becomes a new part of society ready to sustain a, uh, a new history. Ambrose Phillips wrote a poem called The Splendid Shilling where he celebrates this shilling. It is given to a blind man accidentally and the adventures of the shilling just go on. Well, to, to take this device by which one may uh, uh, understand history, see the events of history, and use the coin as a metaphor for mobility change and historical progression, uh, this is an achievement in anyone's book. And when you start writing for the Cougar or any other newspaper that helps you getting experience, why not write a column 
that somehow shows the agility, the cleverness, the wit, the humor, and the competence of Richard Steele. Now we're going to go on to the next newspaper, which is a much more formidable production, and that's The Spectator. The Spectator was published from 1711 to 1714 with a break. It was published six days a week. It ran Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Now, how do you suppose they could do that since you had to set type one day and print the next day? Ms. Mortimer, any ideas? Press the button. Was it done overnight? Yeah, they were all set one day and then printed overnight, right. Go Who's ahead. Two printers. Richard Steele had one printer, Addison had the other. What the, the editions that Steele supervised appeared Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. The editions that Addison supervised published, were published Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and that's the way they did it. Now, this newspaper, too, has a club, the Spectator Club. And among those who are members of the Spectator Club are Sir Roger de Coverley, who is a baronet, a minor functionary. There's a bachelor who is a man of letters, whose name we don't know. Sir Andrew Freeport recognizes, uh, or, uh, recognizes the mercantilistic class. Captain Sentry is an honest serviceman. And Will Honeycomb is the poet. There are rather important essays in this collection. 58 to 63 deal with the issue of false, true wit and false wit. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details, but true wit and false wit essentially suggests the difference between a mind at work that's agile and clever and brilliant and a mind that's relatively dull. True wit is the best word in the best place. The right word at the right time. The cogent argumentation of an idea without tricks. False wit is punning. When you pun, uh, comedians are always punning, but it's a rather low form of comedy. Uh, Also, false wit is writing poetry to shapes. If you write shape, uh, poetry in the shape of angels' wings, and you're describing angels. If you write poetry about fruit, and you set it in the form of an apple, with some lines longer and some shorter forming to this apple. If you write a poem about religion, and it looks like an altar, and some lines are long and sometimes are short, some lines are short, depending on whether you're dealing with the base of the altar or the top of the altar. This is false wit. You don't write poetry to shape. You write poetry because you have certain rhythms, certain lines, and certain ideas, and they should be executed in an intelligent fashion. Uh, many of you, when you were in school, George Washington's birthday, you design an axe and write an essay inside the axe. False wit. The essays on false wit and true wit are, are very, very important. And uh, <clears throat> Addison's definition of wit is not easy to come by. Let me just mention a few points. In a series of essays on wit, he has offered a pure concept. He says that true wit is the natural way of writing with beautiful, beautiful simplicity, which we so much admire in the composition of the ancients. This is in Spectator number 62. He says, the source of wit is truth and good sense. Wit contrasts with frenzy. 
as mirth contrasts with laughter. You can laugh uproariously at something that's absolutely stupid, but when you really enjoy something, it's kind of an inner laughter and an inner enjoyment as well. Addison's wit can be ident identified as intelligence in the old sense. And we know that his idea of wit had greatly influenced uh, Pope's essay on criticism and other works. Addison concludes his discussion on wit with a dream in which he is oppressed by the allegorical images of false wit. He wins relief when he is rescued by the god of wit. And he says, once you understand what is witty and what is truthful, then you understand what the real meaning is of heroic poetry, tragedy, satire, rhetoric, and comedy. All this becomes part of wit. Now, one of the essays that's rather important is number 70, The Ballad of Chevy Chase. I'd like to look at that for just a few moments. The Ballad of Chevy Chase is number 70 in your text. One of the concerns about English literature was when would the next great epic poem be written? Well, people weren't writing epic poems in the 18th century the way, unless they were translating the Iliad or the Odyssey. Uh, we're on page 318. What Addison concluded was that the real epic poetry of English literature is the ballad. The ballad is what tells us what's happening in English life. The ballad is what's telling us what happens in history. And once Addison gave respectability to the ballad, then uh, uh, to the, the ballad, then we had a collection of ballads at the end of the 18th century. In the 19th century, the development of the child's ballads, which is a complete collection of all the English ballads. And in the 20th century, Bertrand Bronson from US, UCLA wrote a comprehensive study of the English ballad, in which he includes a lot of the music as well. Well, in this particular poem, we have the Battle of Chevy Chase. Look on, Addison writes, when I traveled, I took a particular de delight in hearing the songs and fables that come from father to son and are most in vogue among the common people of the countries. He tells the story of the battle of Chevy Chase, when England and Scotland were at war with each other. Percy, Lord Percy, was the English leader. Um, And Robert Bruce was the Scottish leader. And the two of them find themselves in battle at Chevy Chase. When they engage in battle, we hear the hope that peace will come. God save the king and bless the land in plenty, joy, and peace. And grant henceforth that foul debate twixt noblemen may cease. Well, the battle between the English and the Scots is about to begin. The news was brought to Edinburgh where Scotland's king did reign that brave Earl Douglas suddenly was with an arrow slain. Excuse me, I didn't mean Robert Bruce, I meant Douglas instead. Douglas is the Scottish hero and Percy is the British hero. Oh, heavy news, King James did say, Scotland can witness be, I have not any captain more of such account as he. So the loss of a single person in Scotland is a very personal loss, and his being is irreplaceable. The English have a different attitude. So many people are available to take the leadership that anyone who's lost can be replaced by another even more skillful and more powerful. And this is the English point of view. Like tidings to King Henry came, 
within a shorter space, that Percy of Northumberland was slain at Chevy Chase. Now God be with him, said our king, since twill no better be, I trust I have within my realm five hundred as good as he. Now, we get a description of how this battle occurred. With that there came an arrow keen out of an English bow, which struck Earl Douglas in the heart, a deep and deadly blow. So the Scottish leader is falling to the English arrow, who never spoke more words than these. Fight on, my merry men all, for why my life is at an end, Lord Percy sees me fall. These two leaders, each of them engaged, British and Scottish, are characterized in the ballad, and the ballad becomes characteristic of what Addison says is the ultimate epic poetry of the time. There's an interesting essay in The Spectator called Party Patches. In the 18th century, if you had, if you were making up to go out, if you were a woman and you were putting on makeup, if you had a mole on your cheek, you might put a party patch on it, or you might put a patch on it, either to hide it or to emphasize it. Or if you had a blemish on one side of your face, you might put a patch on the other side of the face to detract from it. And people would go to the theater and walk in society with these patches. Well, this particular article, Party Patches, suggests that women who are conservative will patch on the right, and women who are Tory will patch on the left. I'm sorry, women who are Tory will patch on the right, which is conservative. Women who are liberal will patch on the left, which is liberal. The difference between conservative and liberal is not new in the 20th, 21st century. However, what happens is some women who patch for purposes of beauty or for purposes of rectification don't realize that they're patching on the wrong side of the face. And so some women are insulted sitting in the theater to find that there are people with them or people near them who think they are Tory when they are really Whig or think they are Whig when they are really Tory and by misconstruing the political affiliation of the uh, woman by the past she has, confusion abounds and no one is sure what kind of conversation should, should take place or to what extent you can trust a person's point of view. And so party patches becomes a rather uh, interesting uh, political study. In other words, what you are getting is a series of studies of human nature and politics. Now, I want to look at one of the characters in The Spectator, and that's Sir Roger de Coverley. There are a whole series of essays on Sir Roger de Coverley. Sir Roger de Coverley is a baronet. And we learn about him in the second essay of The Spectator, where Steele describes the club. We find Sir Roger at home. We find the Coverley household. And at 109, we meet Sir Roger's ancestors. How do we meet Sir Roger's ancestors? Do you remember several years ago, there was a comedian by the name of Jackie Vernon who would show you a slideshow Imagine an imaginary slideshow, and he would use a kind of cricket to click the shift of modules from one slide to the other. And he would describe Guido the tourist, the, the tour guide, who was leading people through swamps. And you could see Guido with his little hat on his head. And then you'd see one slide, and Vernon would say, uh-oh, there is Guido's hat. 
but it's on a mud bank. And the assumption was that Guido had fallen into the mud and you couldn't find him. Well, Sir Roger's ancestors are quite the same. Sir Roger takes Mr. Spectator into his home and he shows him the paintings on the wall of his family. And here is a painting of one of his great-great-grandfathers, the founder of the family, who was victorious at a medieval just. The next pic picture shows him standing before a beautiful lady at the just, whom he has won and who will become his wife. And so, Mr. Spectator is shown by Sir Roger his various ancestors. Here's one picture, he says, of three of my old aunts. One died a maid. She had never married. She was virgin. This is the way she so chose her life. The second, he said, was a woman who would have remained a maid, except that her lover stole her away, somehow got past the hounds that were protecting the estate, and he captured her away and married her uh, by this act of romance. The third woman, says Sir Roger, remained a maid all her life, but not by choice. She really wanted to get married, and no one would marry the poor woman. And here she was. And so you get in Sir Roger's ancestors a picture of life. Then he shows Sir Andrew Freeport. He says, here's Sir Andrew Freeport. Now he says he's a cousin. We weren't sure he's a cousin. But our family has lost a lot of money recently, and he can replenish our coffers. So we're going to admit him as a cousin because he wants to be a cousin, and we might as well say he is a cousin. Sir Roger goes to church. By the way, this is one of the earliest of, uh, you might say, novel techniques. Of course, Chaucer does it with the Canterbury Tales, where he tells tales, and he has a stream of dialogues uh, uh, before the tales and after the tales to give us perhaps the first unified novel. So Roger goes to church and he falls asleep and is awakened by his own snoring in some cases. Whereupon he goes about the church waking up other people who are sleeping and condemning them for sleeping during the sermon. He is a, uh, a paternal figure in the parish. He himself was disappointed in love. When he was a young man he sought to marry a woman who spurned him. And after, ever, ever since that time, Sir Roger didn't care how he dressed and didn't care how he looked. And he never married, but he did have love affairs among the gypsies. And so we have at least two essays where we have Sir Roger involved with the gypsies. Uh, at one point, one of the gypsies tries to sell Sir Roger his daughter, and Sir Roger won't go for that. There is an important essay, number 117, is, which is on witchcraft. Maul White is a witch, people say. She's an old woman, and she has a broomstick in her house, and a black cat, and you know that on some evening she is riding that broomstick, and fondling that black cat. Now, by this time, people didn't believe in witches in, in the 18th century. That is, the, the witch scare had gone by. But there are still people who are superstitious. And in this particular essay, Addison is very sympathetic toward old women who are being condemned as witches. Why are they being condemned? Number one, when milk curdles on the doorstep, women claim the mall white had come by. They hear her mumbling her prayers. And she seems to be saying her prayers backwards. And whenever you say anything backwards, you are speaking the word of the devil. Don't you remember some years ago when people were claiming that record companies were producing records that if you played them backwards would have secret clandestine messages in them. Well, that's no more than the myth you're looking at here. But what 
Addison is doing is very clearly stating that there is no witch scare. Stop condemning old women. Take them into your parish. Show them some compassion. And don't condemn them. So essentially, with all of these stories by Roger de Coverley, Number 130 is Sir Roger and the Gypsies. 131, the country's opinion of the spectator, what people think about journalism. 132, a scene in the stagecoach. If you want to get a hold of the spectator, uh, Professor Bond has a complete edition of the spectator in our library, a three-volume edition. And you can read all the Sir Roger de Coverley reports. I'll just name them quickly so you have them again. Um, one, two, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 118, 119, 120, 121, 122, 123, 125, 126, 130, 132, 269, 329, 335, 383, and 517 becomes the death of Sir Roger. If you want to write a research paper for this class, you can write about Sir Roger de Coverley by focusing on any single one of these essays. And I think you would find the essay is challenging, not only in the, the degree that you learn about religion, social behavior, but you also learn about the government of England through these findings. Now, when you get into The Spectator, you get into a lot of topics that are really quite important. But The Spectator produced two types of articles that are essential for your understanding. One is the study of Paradise Lost, and the second is a study that you have in, your, in the pages I provided, and the pages that are, should be on the web CT, on the pleasures of the imagination. So first of all, let's look at the pleasures of the imagination. Now, every day for 11 days, consecutively, a series of essays appeared on the imagination. How the mind works, how we learn anything, how we gain knowledge. And if you begin to look at some of these documents, let's see essentially what they say. The first paper deals with the perfection of sight above other senses. We develop our imagination primarily from sight. And from the imagination comes understanding. So you look at number 411 first. Let's just look at that briefly and see what uh, we can discover from these essays. Addison tells us, Our sight is the most perfect and most delightful of all our senses. It fills the mind with the largest variety of ideas, converses with its objects at the greatest distance, and continues the longest in action without being tired or satiated with proper enjoyments. The sight gives us objects of nature we can see. The sight gives us words we can interpret. 
The sight gives us objects that we can understand, and the sight gives us objects that we can somehow transfer. So the pleasures of the imagination. First, the sight. Secondly, the sources of the imagination. Where does the imagination get its ideas? It gets it from what is great, what is uncommon, and what is beautiful. Now what is great, of course, is the sublime. We've mentioned this. The sublime is that which is beyond human experience and human understanding, but which contributes nuances of appreciation to our lives. A tree, of course, is great. You, no one is larger than a tree. And in symmetry, it's something special. A great river is always impressive. When you watch the coal barges, the, the, uh, the boats pushing coal barges up the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers, you get a sense of the power of the sea. When you look at a cloud forming into a thunderstorm, you get a sense of power and grandeur and greatness. And what is uncommon? What uncommon is what surprises you. Any architecture produces a new edifice that you've never seen before. It gives you a certain surprise and a certain understanding. When you see a runner or a swimmer who swims faster than anyone else has swum before, you get a sense of what is uncommon and you're amazed at this agility. When you see a new work of art, an ARP, a Giacometti, a Max Ernst, and you've never seen art this way before, or Picasso, or Dali, and you just sit there and wonder how the artist developed these ideas. It's because they're uncommon, they're unexpected, they're unusual, they win your attention. And then, this is not part of the sublime, what is beautiful? Now, anything beautiful is basically symmetrical, according to these ideas. Beauty is a way of seeing things in an order, seeing, seeing objects or concepts in an order, and appreciating the way the order gives you a sense of harmony or a sense of human, a, a unity. You may talk about a beautiful jacket. You may talk about a beautiful ad. You may talk about a beautiful natural prospect. You may talk about the beauty of a whale as it sounds. You may talk about the beauty of a squirrel. We have squirrels on campus here. I don't know who ever thought up a squirrel. I mean, what is a squirrel? It looks like a small dinosaur. <coughs> a big tail or some kind, of, some kind of odd animal. But there's a certain beauty in seeing the symmetry, the movement, the agility, and the uh, intelligence of these squirrels. So beauty is something that gives you a sense of harmony, a sense of peace, a sense of appreciation. The next essay is, how are all these created? And for Addison, the supreme, the supreme author of being gives us what is great and what is beautiful. And the supreme author of being essentially helps us understand what the world looks like. Natural beauty is essay number 414. You go into a forest and you're impressed by the trees. You go into a valley and you like the rolling hills. You go into the water and watch the sea ahead of you. Watch the ripples in the waves. Watch the life that's underneath that you hadn't anticipated. 
Number 415 is architecture. Some of you may be in the school of architecture. Architecture affects the imagination. Greatness in architecture relates to bulk or it relates to a certain delicacy. He says there is a certain type of architecture in the first ages of the world amongst the Greeks and the Romans. There's architecture in eastern climates. There are concave and convex figures that give special appearances to works of architecture. What's the, what's the prettiest piece of architecture on this campus? Ms. Close, what do you like to see when you walk around? The, what's the, what do you think is the finest piece of architecture on this campus? Which building? Probably the architecture building. The building. Yeah, the architecture building was uh, retraced from drawings of a French architect by the name of Ledoux in the 18th century. It was originally an office building. And those plans were resurrected to put them on the University of Houston campus. And then the, the lantern on top represents a, a Greek temple. And the, uh, the cavernous halls inside the College of Ar Architecture, the broad sweeping staircases, uh, you may have a point. Ms. Crockett, what do you think is the most beautiful building on this campus? I'd probably have to agree with the um, architectural building, because it's the one thing you can see from the highway because of the Greek looking temple on top. So you're impressed by spectacle. There are some people who claim that a coal elevator is the most beautiful type of architecture because number one, it's simple, it serves a function, and it's elegant. You watch the coal going up in buckets to the top where it pours into a pile, a, a coal pile. I used to think, we used to have on, out on the uh, Route 10 some grain elevators magnificent white grain elevators. When you drive west through Kansas, you can see these grain elevators far off. I thought these were magnificent pieces of architecture. What type of sculpture do you like on campus? What do you think is the best? Every time you build a building on this campus, 1% of the cost must be uh, used to purchase art. It must be used for the purchase of art. What sculpture on this campus do you like the best? Mr. Clary? The pylons yeah, yeah. on the side of the, uh, uh, on either side, they're split pylons. You have a single, zig, uh, a single pyramid and they were split into single pylons, right. Right, right? And that's the entrance. That was meant to be a very impressive thing. I'm glad you like that. Yeah. Any other types of architecture, Miss Look? Any types of sculpture on this campus do you think is elegant, unique, gives this campus a different type of spirit? with the statue playing a guitar. Yeah. How about the walking men? That giant stainless steel sculpture of three walking men walking through them. I should have pictures of them here to see them, but I think that's a magnificent creation. It is certainly symmetrical in some ways. It's also grand, and it also gives you a strikingly beautiful appearance. Secondary pleasures of the imagination. What are secondary pleasures of the imagination? This is the type of imagination that takes you from the sights and senses you experience to generate new ideas in the mind. The secondary pleasures of the imagination give, you, give the artist the capability to produce statuary, painting, music. And the power of words becomes part of the pleasures of the imagination. Let's take the power of words, for example, and a, uh, take the word walk. 
right? Now let's be a little bit more imaginative when we talk about the word walk. Of course, walk can be simply this, right? But what happens when you're moving like that? What word do you use? Oh, the strolling is this. <laughs> but it's a good word. How about another word for walk? What if someone comes in the room like this? <coughs> How would you describe him? He what? Skulks. Skulks. Yeah, skulk is a little bit more treacherous. I, was, I thought I was sidling into the room, but you say I was skulking. All right, skulking. Fine. So now for the word walk, you've got walk, sidle, stroll, skulk. What other? Amble. Amble. Oh. That's ambling, right? Pardon me? Friends. No, that's only for the women. <laughs> only women. Friends. Strolling. strolling. I think we did a little bit of strolling a little bit before. But let's go with the imagination. More words about mobility. You may mosey about. Good word. Other words for walking. Swagger. Oh, yeah. Look, you've got at least 10, 12 words for one simple four-letter word. And it's your imagination that's moving words into a creative format. By the way, you'll do that when you write papers for this class. You look for the better word, not just for the easiest word. You'll show me that your diction is at a higher level, a heightened level, than the diction normally, normally used when you, when you talk. See, that's why I don't like the word things. When you write for this class, do not use the word thing. Because thing is a meaning, meaningless word. It has no intrinsic value. I like this thing. There are a lot of things I want to do. He's got this thing for you. Uh, I wonder what thing's going to happen next. Oh, I hate those things. Yeah, that's the thing I'm not too unhappy about. Uh, yeah, let's go in the grocery store and buy some things. You see, it has no meaning. You want better words for things. Now, the imagination is, of course, what gives you the centaur, right? You have a creature made out of part man and part horse. Have we talked about the centaur before? How does a person think up a centaur? Why do we have a centaur, Ms. Vasquez? Who would have thought up a being that is partially horse and partially human being? What does it do for us? Press your button, please. I guess uh, the writers um, came up with that to, for the readers so that they could, um, like you said, the imagination so they could imagine uh, maybe. But why a horse and why the body of a horse and the front of a human man? Why not the body of a caterpillar and the front of a uh, of a Pig. What does the centaur represent? The centaur, remember, taught Alexander. He was his teacher. Any idea? Mr. Steinberg? Strength. All right. The horse has strength and fecundity, right? It's going to procreate. And how about the human form? What does that give us? Wisdom. 
knowledge, wisdom, right. So you combine a horse and a human being and you have something that never existed before and your imagination tells you that a centaur creates a being that you've never had in your imagination before. Essay number 14 talks about horror and the Gothic. That is, Gothic literature, when you establish a sense of fear amongst people, is also a consequence of the imagination. When you're afraid to turn off the light at night, when you're worried about going into a dark room, when you uh, uh, fear certain problems that you have what we call Gothic, and the imagination gets us into Gothic literature and toward the end of the 18th century. We have the development of Gothic literature ultimately embodied in the story of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley in 1817. Also, science and proportion. Addison deals with science. You look, you think things have one appearance, and then you look in a microscope, and you see the most minute beings and you're involved in a whole new philosophy. A whole new philosophy when you see the smallest objects in proportion and you see the largest objects and you see how they unite with each other and how science becomes itself a process of the imagination. Well, the essays on the imagination are profound. These 11 essays give you a very deep intellectual understanding of the basic premises of thought in the 18th century and they're all written by uh, Joseph Addison. Now there's one other set of essays that I'd like to look at briefly that appear in the Spectator and those are the Paradise Lost Essays. These essays appeared every week not every day, and they appeared over a period of time from January 5th, 1712 until uh, May 3rd, 1712. And they ran every week. Now, what does Addison do for us with Paradise Lost? Essentially, Milton wrote Paradise Lost in 1667. It generally fell out of use, uh, and Addison re-energizes interest in Paradise Lost. Essay number 267 deals with fable or plot. He tries to associate it with classical literature. And let us just briefly mention some of the characteristics of Paradise Lost that we find in the Spectator Papers. Essay number one deals with fable and plot, says Addison, Paradise Lost has one action, one entire action, and what one great action, and that is the arrival of the Christ to bring about peace in the world and to create a new world. In essay number 273, he talks about the great and significance uh, the greatness and significance of the Godhead. What life was what like before the fall. In essay number 279, he talks about the natural and the sublime. He is somewhat concerned, however, and critical of Milton's use of artillery in heaven. He's not sure how the artillery got up to heaven. Essay number deals with language. He talks about Milton's metaphors, Milton's idioms of the tongue, Milton's syntax, Milton's perspicuity, his ability to see things and to express them in unique ways. Well, I'm going to go on and on, but again, 
it would be useful to you if you're looking for a research topic to take any one of these essays and discover what you know about Paradise Lost and what Milton knew about Paradise Lost, what Addison knows about Paradise Lost, and what we all should know about Paradise Lost. Well, journalism is a very, very significant venture in the 18th century, and I hope you all get involved in journalistic enterprise. Thank you. <laughs>